Um, so I was lucky enough to start learning Russian at school. Um, I was 16 and it was when I was doing my A-levels and we had the chance to do a Russian GCSE in our lunch, well, I, I, just four hours a week. I think it was a, an extra subject in our three periods. Um, and I think they started off with about eight of us and gradually people dropped out as it got harder and harder. And I think there were just four of us left at the end <laughs> who were determined enough to stick it out. Um, and yeah, I found myself really enjoying it. I, I was doing German too, and I'd already done a bit of French. So I'd say that by the age of 16, I was already quite an obsessive language learner. Um, I don't think I expected Russian to be quite as hard as it was. <laughs> it was a bit of a shock. <laughs> and years later, I was still trying, struggling to get my head around it. There's some things I think I only finally understood when I actually started teaching Russian, uh, taught Russian A-level for two years, and then I stopped. I, I don't teach Russian anymore. Um, uh, but yes, it's a sort of lifelong learning project, I'd say. <laughs> Masha, what about you? What's your um, sort of history with Russian and English? Um, well, with Russian, I was born in Russia. I suppose there was not much choice to choose another native language. But with English, yeah, it's a classic case. I um, learned, started learning English at school at the age of 10 and proceeded on kind of later on. I, I went to, um, to do some sort of evening evening classes you know, since the age of about 14 and then realised that I, I just want to do English, I just want to do languages um, quite quickly after that and, and then followed in, in university where I did English language and literature. So I suppose that's that's how that's how it started. In terms of translation, um, I I was trying to when I was preparing for today, I was trying to kind of understand, ask this question to myself, what is it that made me want to do translation i really haven't got an answer to be honest i i think i remember the first book that i properly read in english from cover to cover was sydney sheldon's if tomorrow comes i don't know if you <laughs> it's really sort of lowbrow crime fiction <laughs> that was about 16 and i remember taking a notebook out and started writing it in russian started translating the first chapter I don't know why I still haven't got an answer to that so that was just a process that fascinated me so that, yeah this is the original this is the English but how would you you know read it in Russian how would you write it in Russian so I don't know it was it was quite difficult to, to um, come by a, a proper English book proper American book in this case if you got hold of anything whatever it is crime fiction you know anything you you you'd be like over the moon if you especially if it's the original quite a lot of adapted texts were available yes but not original not not in back in the day then no internet obviously and no kind of uh, secure channel to kind of you know get your supply of books uh, permanent supply of books but yes it's it's then that was my first experience and then um Fast forward a few years, I joined the British Council well, where I dealt with projects to do with art and um, drama was one of them. And um, somehow I was asked to translate a play, which was by a um, Nigerian Irish writer called Gabriel Gbadamosi. And it was a very abstract storyline. It was, there was poetry there, there was, um, kind of all sorts of you know sound imitations because animals were characters in it as well so you name it so that was my next experience in translation where I had to actually submit a copy for a festival where uh, a rehearsed reading would be produced of my translation so I can't tell you how much hair I lost over that translation because I felt like an imposter I felt like I I can't do this job this is this has to be a professional who do it but yeah, that's that was the next experience. Very odd, really bizarre. But I still did you, remember. Did you see the performance of it? How did it feel to hear your work? Being uh, I I didn't hear the performance. I wasn't there. But um, I was told that um, it was such a complex thing to read. It was such a difficult thing to kind of do as a staged reading that you know the actors were quite sort of gobsmacked and they and they told me 
oh, well done. And I thought, wow, not at all. <laughs> really, <laughs> I didn't feel like it was well done, completely not. But and it was a very interesting experience because it had to be, uh, every time I've written a, a passage of, of this translation, I had to say out loud, it had to sound properly, not just look properly on paper. So that was the first time I kind of had this dilemma. How do you translate when this is going to be read out? So yeah, this, I can talk endlessly about various aspects of it. So yes, okay. sorry, that was a very long <laughs> introduction. Yeah. You lost your hair, but here you are, still translating. <laughs> yes, some, some still left. <laughs> still some left, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned that one book that you kind of, that you started your translation journey from, that you, you still remember it. But I think kind of going back to the children's literature, I think each of us has a special book or maybe a few books that we read as a child and we kind of carried it on with us um, for years and years into adulthood and then trying to pass it on to our kids to read, etc. Um, so also a question maybe Masha talking about the Russian books. Um, so when you were growing up, uh, which were the Russian children's book, books that really made an impression on you? And maybe there are some Soviet classics as well that you would like to see translated. And before you answer that, I encourage the audience maybe to use chat and drop us a line about your childhood favorites. They don't have to be uh, by a Russian author or Russian speaking author. It doesn't matter. Something that you really loved, maybe one title, two titles max while growing up. And it will be just interesting to see. We might have a lovely reading list as mm -hmm. a takeaway from this event. Yeah. So feel free. So Masha, any favorites? Um, yes, I um, was preparing to kind of talk about this the other day. Um, I was thinking that um, kind of maybe as, as a general kind of, um, you know, readership of, of, of those times. I, I was a very ordinary Soviet child, I suppose, and I, I read from the list that my school recommended or the books that were readily available at the library. I sometimes would come to the library and say, oh, what have you got? interesting and they would recommend you the the official recommendation as it were the party line sort of list <laughs> from uh from um, you know for your age group everything's quite regimented and so um i suppose that i i read those books and they were mostly books i would either romanticize in war like arkadi gaidar or it would be kind of stories like uh, Dragunsky's Diniski Niraskaze where, you know, it'd be a um, sort of a life of an ordinary boy of, of, a, of the Soviet times with adventures, there had to be adventures. So I thought, you know, I, I suppose looking back at, you know, at that time and, and comparing it with now, I think young adult literature we currently know is that relatively new in Russia. Mm -hmm. What I, I think, and if, if, if we take it to mean a genre that focuses first on real problems of the teenagers, rather than idolized school stories or mysteries with teenage protagonists. So, um, and it's not fair to say that this kind of young adult, young adult literature didn't exist at all, but I suppose the books that were in everyone's focus and readily available were those kind of happy endings books um, where there's always um, a place for a heroic deed, something has to happen, a boy has to save a girl, or I don't know, you know, it was kind of very black and white. There were positive characters, negative characters. So, and also there wasn't much of a kind of any any sort of trouble, any any bad stuff. If it was bad stuff going on, then the goodies would come and sort it all out and it will end well. So this this is my Soviet literature that I was growing up with, apart from fairy tales, of course, and science fiction, which I absolutely loved. And um, there was this magic of childhood stories where, you know, there wasn't anything raw, anything kind of particularly troublesome. Uh, that's, that's my impression. So that has changed a lot since then. 
And I suppose, yeah, those those uh, pictures you're seeing on screen right now, these these are the ones that I I was, you know, you could, I could be lost in reading at the age of, sort of 10, 11, and um, was totally, totally immersed in. So, um, yeah, and I remember this, this one thing, I remember uh, you probably can relate, Tanya, as well, that when we were at school, we had this summer list, you know, ma massive, long reading list for the summer, where we had to read, you know, several dozens of books. And we needed to keep a reading diary where we needed to write a short kind of synopsis of the book. But then the question always about each book was, what does this book teach you? And you had to always kind of come up with the answer. So this has to, the book can't be just written for no purpose. It has to teach you something, um, something moral, something good. You know, a book about nothing is unheard of, was unheard of. For instance, the, the book I reviewed for, for our blog, Roskid Lit, uh, which is I See In Your Sons by Virkin. Nothing's happening there, but it's <laughs> one of the best books I've ever read. So uh, it's about life. <laughs> so yeah, I suppose that's, that's, um, that's, that's it for you... me in terms of you know, Soviet, the, the Soviet literature in my life as, as a child. I like it when reading encourages you to throw away the whole book. It's Sorry, lovely seeing everyone's um, suggestions of their books that they, they remember fondly. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, we've got really some classics. Um, there is Cipollina, of course. Gianni Rodari was a great friend of the Soviet Union. And yes, <laughs> and I think little did we know what really what the book was about when we were reading it, actually. Um, of course, Nisnaika, yes. Uh, somehow definitely I personally Nisnaika. never got into Nisnaika when I was a child, but yes, definitely Nisnaika. And um, I think the film was more the popular than. Book. Yeah, than the actual book. I don't know. I know. I know. I know people who grew up reading Nisnaika, and there are people who kind of yeah Nisnaika, but they were not really big fans. I can see also The Clown of God by Tommy De Paula. I, I don't know this one. Something special for me by Vera Williams. There is Charlotte Webb. Oh, it's lovely, lovely books. Um, of course, there is Philip Pullman's Northern Lights. There is Roald Dahl. Um, yeah, there is Emilianov, Zilone Karabol. Uh, Povist on the Station Chilavekia. Oh, yes, the classic, of course. Yeah, classic. I um, cried my eyes out the reason that. Um, well, I didn't read any Russian literature until I was 18 and then went mad trying to catch up, very conscious that there was a centuries of history and of literature that I wanted to make sure I'd read. So I read a lot later. But um, growing up, um, yeah, I read and loved a lot of the English classics, which I wouldn't particularly push on my children now to Blighton. Um, Dahl, we do have all of the Dahl and, and I could love them too. Um, but the books that I've carried with me and that we've still got on our shelves and I reread regularly are um, The Owl Who Was Afraid of the Dark. It's just uh, such a precious one and I've inflicted that on both of my sons twice. <laughs> I have to read that every few years. Um, and two that I'm um, really fond of um, but haven't read again more recently are um, Astrid Lindgren and Alf Poison, Little Miss Pepperpot, who in Norwegian is um, Little Spoon, I think. <laughs> I think her name means spoon. Um, and I think I'm fond of them because I, I remember the story that came with those books. It, it was um, uh, my older brother was, was in the Scouts and we had a Scout exchange and some um, uh, family came from Sweden. And I think I've, I so loved the idea that they'd bought these books and I had these Swedish books that nobody else had, nobody else knew, you know, I didn't remember. I, they say everyone's read Astrid Lindgren, but actually I don't remember my friends reading Astrid Lindgren. I thought that was something that just I had. <laughs> um, and, you know, they've stayed with me. So I think that's one reason I'm so uh, perhaps obsessive about um, children's books from around the world, around the world is I think there's, um, well, it broadens the possibilities and it broadens the range of places you can read about and different types of stories. But um, I think when we come across a book that's that's not one that everyone else is reading. There's something quite special about that too. 
Yeah. Well, and yeah, then lots of children's that. books I love that I've read as an adult, so I've, I've got much more into children's yeah. literature in the last few years. Um, I think after and, after and, and, and I discovered a lot of books I would have liked to have read when I was younger, but didn't have. Thank you. I just yeah, said something lovely. about sorry <laughs> about what Marcia was saying about um, young adult literature is really interesting about how that's a development really quite recently in in Russia, and I'd say the same was true for me growing up. Um, that when I was sort of in younger teen, I was an ambitious reader and, and was sort of bored and not really challenged or interested in a lot of the books that teachers were recommending to me or that was coming across at the library. And I remember being excited when I first came across the sort of new young adult ones that were coming from America that we didn't really have um, many, this is in the 80, early 90s, um, you know, there weren't so many British writers um, writing for teens then, but I remember loving Judy Bloom and, and one book got um, I'd love to read again one day actually, it's Begonia for Miss Applebaum and that was um, an American story about growing up and I think it was the first story I ever read that had, um, well, it, just, it was a different setting and I think I was really you know, intrigued by reading about another way of school, another way of sort of, you know, just vaguely slightly different society and I think that's something I've always looked for when I'm reading is going to different places. And um... Any books that you've read recently, maybe obviously not the classics and, you know, the kind of older books, any any contemporary books? And maybe I think I would love to talk about the young adults and teenage literature, but maybe first, um, any recommendations kind of for younger readers, for both of you also, Masha, if, if, you, if, you, if you come across um, any books in Russian? that you read in the last few years and you would love to see published in English or maybe they've already been translated but we don't know about them. Um, yeah, I wanted to mention a couple of books because obviously this, you know, there's quite a lot to choose from, but um, so something that made impression on me, this is a book called Slushy Ptits by Victoria Lebdeva and it's, um, it's just a story that resonated with me, something I really kind of fell in love with. It's it's about um, growing up. It's about, you know, this is the main character is a boy who who gets sent to spend the summer with, with this family of distant relatives of his. He's from a big city. They live in the back of beyond somewhere in Siberia. They've got loads of children. He doesn't really know them well. And the parents who are in trouble, who are about to lose their flat because they're out of money, they have to send him away for the summer, although they promised him that he'd go to Disneyland. And he has to go there, has no choice, where he has to grow up very quickly. So um, this resonated with me quite because of with my childhood, I suppose. That's that's why um, um, I, um, I liked I like that book. And we were just talking about this uh, with, with Ruth earlier about the personal choice about how, you know, we fall in love with the book and we want to translate it. It's, it's really down to our um, kind of this moment when you just fall in love with someone's writing. And if the story is something that appeals to you and you think, oh, will, will the international audience be able to enjoy it like I do? And that's how you decide. But then, yeah, there's a whole other question of then what the publisher will say. That's a totally different <laughs> different area. And another book I wanted to mention, which is probably not really <laughs> for children, although it is a, um, it, it won a prize, an award for, for in, in the children's section. And it's by uh, Maria Martirosova. It's called Fotografi na um, And it's quite a sad book. Um, and it's about, it's about uh, it's written by an Armenian who lives in Russia, who is a specialist in Russian language. Uh, and it's a book about an Armenian girl who grew up in Baku, in Azerbaijan. And one day she opens up a pack of old photos and she starts going through them and remembering her family, remembering, uh, finding out about people from her family she doesn't know, has, hasn't ever met. And it's like a trip down the memory lane, but then she has to also find out about these people that she never met. And uh, there's, there's quite a lot in it in terms of emotion and um, sadness. But I think people have to have to learn about this it's about 
children who find out what is it to be a different nationality? What is it like to live next to someone who's suddenly announced, pronounced an enemy? And does this change anything for you? So it asks very important questions. And I was quite surprised to see that um, as a prize winner. And I thought, yeah, that's definitely worth, worth noting. And I personally loved translating. Yeah. Crossed. It's hard to marry the, that dream and the reality, isn't it, sometimes? But that sounds like a lovely one. Uh, so, yeah, maybe at risk. In, anything can I, from you? Or we can, can I talk about the younger? We can talk about translation. Yeah. yeah. About younger age group first. I wanted to show a couple of picture books, which I think you've got pictures of as well, haven't you? The one that I've got open in front of me is quite a, um, a recent one from Samarkat publisher. And um, obviously, there's lots of publishers in Russia that do children's books, but this is one that I keep going back to. And every time I open their catalogue, I think, oh, I want all of those books and I want to translate them all. Oh, it's so beautiful. Um, this one's called My Mama Samolot. Um, you know, and um, I think it, there's an um, sorry, I've forgotten the word. There's an animation of it, and I think the animation came first, and then the book. But I'm not, I'm not exactly sure of the story of it. But it is absolutely super illustrations, and it's um, everyone's mum's got a different job, and my mum's an aeroplane, and she just flies around taking <laughs> taking uh, people on adventures, rescuing them. Um, and it's all in, uh, it's not rhymed throughout, but it's lovely language. And it's my summer holiday dream to sit and spend a couple of days doing a sample of this and try to find a publisher, but to translate it in rhyme, because I think it would just be really lovely as a, as a rhyming book throughout. Um, so that's my current dream. Or oh, the end of the night where he flies off with his mom. <laughs> it's a real dreamy, imaginative, um, kind of playful book, that one. Um, Another one that's that I, I love also from Summer Cut that's not been translated. If anyone knows any publishers, tell them I want to translate these books <laughs> with Masha, perhaps. Uh, this one's um, a really lovely illustrated um, version of an old poem by Elsie Mandelstam. It's called Va Tramvaya, Two Trams. And it's also based on an um This one, I think, was an animation first. That's why I'm confusing the two. And um, this one's a really wonderful and um, um, short animated film with these incredible. Um, oh, what's the word? Sort of carb sort of paper cut out illustrations. It's sort of oh, you can't see very well, I think, but really textured, atmospheric um, models with with paper characters and sort of moving along. It's a lovely story, and it's a poem from oh, it must be like nineteen ten, sort of um, early twentieth um, century. Um, I'm obviously a very, very famous poet and it's a, a well-known poem that's been translated before in various editions. Um, there's a lovely version that was published a couple of years ago by I think New York, New York Review Books. Sorry if I said that right. New York Review of Books. Um, they produced a lovely children's um, edition with a few um, classic 20th century um, children's poems. Um, but reading that one, I thought, oh, I want to translate it again differently <laughs> because there's never a, a right answer and it's sub a subjective process. But, you know, one one poem could could lead into so many different translations. And um, yeah, so that's a personal sort of on my wish list. But the time that it takes to translate poetry, even to do a short sample is, oh, I don't even know when I would start on it. One day. <laughs> that's, that's the two picture books I wanted to show. Um, okay. And actually, some more older we, um, books, but I'll let Masha have a chance to talk again. Because we're talking about this, both of you are saying, "Oh my God, I I saw this book, I loved it, uh, I, I and I wanted to see it translated." But maybe just we'll talk about the young adults and some recommendations for that age age group in a minute. But kind yeah. of because I think it links nicely into kind of the job of a translator because mm. sometimes just loving a book or falling in love with a book is not enough, sadly. And um, could you maybe elaborate a little bit? So what needs to happen for the book to not only get translated, but obviously to find the, the readers? Nice to do a start. It's a big, a big process, isn't it? <laughs> what do you want Where to do I start? <laughs> Um, you know you know where I'm going with uh, probably with this question because you both of you worked on this wonderful book and yet the English readers haven't seen it just yet not hopefully yet. soon no, not yet not yet 
has to, we haven't found a brave enough publisher. He's waiting for us. We just haven't come by yet. Ruth, what, what do you think? Maybe you should start because yeah. the UK publishing, <laughs> well, um, you know, uh, well, ordeal. Tell, I love the way you phrased that question when you sent the questions to us. You, you said, um, which Russian books did you love so much that you translated them? I thought, I'm not sure if it ever actually has happened that way, but there's things that I've loved so much and wanted to translate, but I have not had the time, not had the opportunity. Um, um, and there's books that I've translated, which I loved, but it wasn't because I, I said, I love this book, I want to translate it. Um, so they come about in different ways, but I mean, just for anyone who doesn't know much about translation, because after all, um, all of us, we sort of come to it and don't know how the publishing world works. Um, but um, to publish a translation, um, you, I mean, you can't just translate a book and publish it. Obviously, you will send it to a publisher. You need to have the permission to translate, translate and um, and have a contract with the English language publisher. And before that, the English language publisher has to acquire the rights from the Russian publisher. But how do English publishers even hear about Russian books in the first place? Um, you know, there's a couple of um, literary agents and um, there's a few publishers that have, have connections, but, um, but basically very few English publishers know about Russian books. So they rely on, on translators or people like us to, to recommend books, but that in itself is a very time consuming process. So that's one reason we've wanted to start the blog was to, was to raise awareness of brilliant books that publishers should be seeing. Um, uh, because I think for languages like Russian, it really relies a lot on, on hard work behind the scenes by, by translators finding a book, which in, just to start with just involves buying books or, or reaching out to publishers and saying, please can you send review copies to, to translate a sample, but, but not be paid for it. That's you know, a big commitment of time. And then to describe the book, write a review or a, um, what's often described as a reader's report. Um, and to send that to publishers, to pitch to publishers, that's all really very time consuming. And I've done it with a, a couple of books and, and in fact, um, um, Punishment of the Hunter by Yulia Yakalova and Marsha and I, we both worked on a sample of that together and, and, and sent it off to publishers. But it's, and so we were sort of hit lucky on that one, but so with other books I've pitched, you know, it's loads and loads of work before, you, before a publisher's interested and then they want more of the, of the sample. Um, so a lot, all of that goes on behind the scenes. Um, and when you know that, you think, gosh, it's actually remarkable that anything is translated because it's so slow and so time consuming. And, and, and of course, it's also um, it's a big outlay of money by the publisher to pay for a translation. Um, so we're lucky that there are funding streams and um, there's a couple of um, translation funds in Russia, but then also ones like English Pen, which you mentioned at the beginning, which um, also sometimes um, uh, covers children's books. Um, so that's a long way of saying, um, no, actually the, the, the Russian books that I've translated, it's been um, because a publisher has come to me with a book. Um, um, and it's, uh, oh, it's been because of um, a, a program or a scheme um, aimed at promoting children's books, like in other words. Um, perhaps, Marcia, you could say more about you know, in other words scheme if you want, but um, that's how the Raven's Children came about was, um, it's a scheme run by, um, 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 the UK Charity Book Trust, and there was some funding from the Arts Council to pay for samples and information about books. Sorry, Marsha, I just said you could, <laughs> would you want to say some more about that? Because you worked on the sample of that one, didn't you? Um, yeah, well, that was pretty, that, that's, I think you've, you've described it kind of in, in um, quite well. It, it was a project that was really a dream, you know, I wish this, this could continue and happen. Mm -hmm sort of on a yearly basis unfortunately it's stopped now hasn't it um, yeah I think they've just had funding for two years and it's yes. like such a brilliant project but yeah yes it was I such think... a good gateway for foreign language books wasn't it and the, the people who looked at um the the panel as it were who looked at the samples they were so you know professional and so well placed to, to judge what to select but the most important thing they um they did it you know they looked at yeah. quite a lot of quite a lot of samples of translations from foreign languages um you know two years in a row and i was thinking yeah surely somebody else will give this people money and that will continue but no unfortunately it stopped mm. and the whole kind of language learning culture is sort of kind of slightly had a bit of a nosedive didn't it so still hopeful um, yes but, yes but yeah, definitely. It always, always hopeful, hopeful. <laughs> yeah well yeah. it was a great scheme um and it resulted in 
the publication of four books in translation from one was from South Africa, this one from Russia, The Raven's Children, um, one from um, Denmark and another from, oh yeah, from Russia and from Finland, so five books I know of. So it was, um, I think a really, um, and, and uh, Daniel Hahn, who's a translator from um, Portuguese, Spanish and French, he was really active in sort of bringing this together. And I think it showed that there, there needed to be more, um, more institutional support for, um, for books from, from countries where, where there isn't that national support so much, because although Russia does have the Read Russia program, it's not particularly active and it that doesn't really give much support for children's books, I would say. I hope that's not too much of a criticism, but I you know, don't see a lot of um, institutional support for, for children's books, whereas some Western European countries, for example, um, Netherlands, in Germany, you know, gosh, countries, Germany, Quite they're amazing. really investing a lot in, in, in marketing their books, aren't they, in samples and yeah, sending them yeah. to publishers. So, yeah, it's tricky because it means a lot is left to translators to, to do to sort of make those connections and sort of market those books. And that's really been a, a kind of a, sorry, that's put pushing onto the Russian Kid Lib blog, but that's another reason why we wanted to set it up, wasn't it? It was to sort yeah. of keep that momentum. Yeah. You know? do tell, do tell. Yeah. yeah. So sorry. why don't you t tell us about the Russian um, Russian Kid Lit blog because I think it's an amazing resource and I think for everybody who doesn't know what to read or which book to recommend to their children of different ages um, this is a fantastic resource so Ruth, Masha, just tell us please <laughs> Yeah, well, Ruth years, is the mastermind of, of this she, <laughs> no, she was the one who came up with this idea and then uh, we we realized that it will take quite a lot of our time that we will have to do evenings and late evenings and you know uh, sacrifice our children and family life and, <laughs> <laughs> but Ruth really uh, it's if it wasn't for Ruth I, I think it'd still be an idea she finally said right okay we're doing it no more putting just, you off <laughs> so yeah. we'd already started um, World Kid Dip Blogs which actually was, uh, wasn't started by me but I've become quite involved with it in about two years ago and that's where we really try and highlight books from um, from all around the world, which could be good for translation, and but particularly looking beyond the countries that already have a lot of institutional support. But yeah, we talked about it for a couple of years, didn't we, Marsha? But there's just not enough, nobody supporting or selling these um, uh, Russian books to an English audience. And also for, you know, there's some really brilliant websites, like one that we could perhaps show a, a picture, an image of is a lovely website called Pupman Book. And there are, of course, lots of resources, loads of um, websites for, for Russian readers about Russian books. But we're very aware being in this sort of bilingual families and, and, and it's in these little communities where we're reading in multiple languages, we realise that there's really a, a gap for a blog aimed at people who read in Russian and in English, and also English, Russian bilingual families. You know, um, so yeah, we and the blog, we sort of, started it thinking well we could also have content there in Russian that would be fine but it started off being in English isn't it um so I could uh, if we could show a um share the screen if you like and show the blog I mean um have you got it on your screen Tatiana yeah um I'm like so, like Masha said we we talked about it realized we haven't got much time to spend on it but we sort of intentionally created it with um, Ekaterina Shatalova, another Russian children's book expert, and who translates um, children's books from French and English into Russian. Um, in fact, she reads a lot more than we, we do, doesn't she? She's really, really um, a key sort of motivator behind the blog. But when we set it up, we really wanted to make it a community initiative so that anybody who's interested in writing about children's books, uh, Russian children's books um, in English can submit um, reviews to us. And, um, and in fact, we've had contributions from four or five different people. Um, so if anybody here is interested to get involved, we'd really love to hear from you because yeah, we'd started it knowing that we weren't gonna have much time on it and we've probably managed about one review a month, haven't we? So it's not, or maybe less. <laughs> well, we started it just before the pandemic. So yeah, it's been a struggle to kind of keep it going. But whenever I do read a book, I think right, I must write a review of it and share it. And maybe somebody, maybe a, an English publisher will read that and decide to take a punt on it. I think it's a fantastic idea. I think, especially given how many, as you said, bilingual families are there in the UK, and it's often that 
parents again read and enjoyed a certain book, if a children's mm -hmm. book, and they want their children to read this book, right? But sometimes the kids, while well, they speak Russian, perhaps they may not be confident Russian readers. So I think a translated version becomes a fantastic kind of a bridge between kind of the parents' culture and childhood memories and the kids' memories. Mm -hmm. And also I think there are quite a lot of new interesting books and especially for young adults as well I was surprised because I I always feel that uh, writing for teenagers and writing for um, young adults in Russia is a very complex task just mm. because of the kind of censorship associated with certain topics that I think are very um, relevant to uh, young people growing up um, so I've seen some really fantastic um, books on on your blog, um, ladies. So could you tell us? I, I had a couple of pictures, and I do have some books with me. So I, I hopefully I can show. Um, yeah. yeah, I can show the covers. Would do you want me to um, share my screen, and then I can show. Um... Yes. I mean, I've just yes. put the link to um, I just put the link to the blog on in the chat so anyone can find it. Um, but I'm happy to share my screen if you want to. Yes, you can if you want to go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So we've um, been lucky to have contributions to the blog. Um, uh, from um, various reviewers, and um, this is one um, book that I wanted to, to mention. I won't talk about it in, in depth, but there's a review here. Um, this shows you just the sort of books that we've um, reviewed already. It's um, picture books, um, middle grade novels, so sort of um, late juniors, um, and then some of them are, are teen or young adult books. Um, carrying on from what you said, Tatiana, about um, sort of quite challenging themes, um, coming up in, in a young adult literature now. Um, and this book's from a few years ago now. I think it was published in, by Summer Card in 2013. Um, but it was quite a radical one in Russia in that it's um, about a gay character. So it's, and it deals with homophobia in um, Russian cities. Um, it's really, um, it's called Playing a Part. Um, and uh, it's reviewed here by Olga Buchina, who's a, a translator of, um, Children's books into Russian um, and a real expert. Um, so in Russian, it was Shutovsky Kolpak. Um, and it's really a very atmospheric story set in a, um, a, a theatre or a young, it's a, a teenage boy who's um, whose real sort of escape from, from the horrors of school um, is in this theatre world and the, the, the people he knows there. Um, yeah, it's really a lovely and moving story. Um, but when I read it, I must say I was surprised that that really is one of the very rare. Um, teenage books that has been translated from Russian. And actually that was the basis of the blog actually very, right at the beginning we did a blog post um, just sort of capturing a list of all of the translations from Russian into English that we know of. And you might be shocked by how few there've been. They're really, I mean, obviously we're finding out about ones all the time and, and Katarina Katja is always sending me messages saying, oh, I found another one, <laughs> another Russian book. But I mean, this is a list, um, there's really not many. And especially when you compare to language like French or German or Spanish. I did a review of um, uh, for a magazine of German books the last th 30 years of translations from German and there'd been something like 500 translations from German in 30 years and for Russian it's more like 15, <laughs> 20 max. <laughs> um, so not many from uh, for teenagers that have been translated. Um, uh, but the two that I wanted, I'll let Marsha have a chance to talk so I feel like I'm talking too much, but <laughs> the one no, I wanted to talk no, about was this, um, Pi Day, Dienci Slapid. Um, and another that I've got, it's not on the blog yet, um, but I think you had an image. I'll, let, I'll swap back to your screen now, if that's okay. Okay. I have the actual book, Dienci Slapid, so I have it here. Okay. I've only read it on the Kindle. And that's... Um, um, how do I stop? Screen. Sorry, I'm having a moment of difficulty. Oh, here we are. And also, um, the Ravens' children obviously have been <laughs> translated. The one that we talked about earlier. Um, yeah, so and Masha are... and I were having an interesting chat earlier, just before preparing for this, talking about 
how different the age banding can be from from Russia to the UK or or, in, or USA, and um, um, how complicated that makes translation. Um, and it's true for other countries too. So a book that's written, um, published anywhere, Germany, Sweden, might not necessarily be considered the eight, same age group when it's translated into English. And the Raven's Children is one that was um, aimed at, in Russian as 12 plus. And so was this one. Uh, which yes, was, to our surprise. We've got time, we might have a little read of her songs um, Vlasov. Um, whereas we, we had quite a long conversation, didn't we, about how in English we think it would probably be suitable for a younger age group. You know, I think um, there's a, a faster progression perhaps in, in English education system towards reading chapter books. And so, uh, and I think the themes, it sort of um, fits more with what's um, uh, familiar for younger readers. Whereas with the Raven's Children, it was a really difficult sort of editorial discussion with the publishers about what age they were going to band it at. And in fact, when I was translating, I was sort of expecting it to be 12 plus. And, and then they, it was at the later stage, I realized, oh, they're going to put it out as a, a middle grade book. So more like eight to 12, which is, is difficult because some of the themes in it are, you know, it's about, this is set in um, uh, 1930s, Stalin purges. It's set in the, you know, in the Great Terror. Um, about a disappearance, a, fam a boy's um, father, like early on in the book, his father is, is disappeared. Um, and although it's written from the perspective of a seven-year-old and it's it's got light moments and it's a fun sort of adventure romp and you can enjoy it on that sort of adventure level, there is also a lot of dark politics there that's, that you could read it as, as an eight or nine-year-old and, and just not appreciate that. But it, it surprised me that Puffin were so keen to put it out as a as a middle grade, um, sort of eight to 12. Um, but isn't it also eight. why it could work, it, I hope, so well for international audience because of the metaphor of this magical bird that snatches people and the fact that it's a black raven and obviously, obviously for a Russian reader, it'll immediately speak as a symbol of, of this time, you know, the Chorny Varanok that used to come and collect people. Mm -hmm. But um, it doesn't have to, to be kind of this, you know, associate with this image if you know nothing about this time. Yeah. And that's why this book, I suppose, was picked because it tells about this time in, in the very kind of true and, and kind of exact <laughs> sort of almost um, terms about what exactly was happening and how people felt there's this atmosphere of fear that is, is rendered so well yeah. but it all is moved to the magical world and that's why yeah. it's, it's and it really operates on those two levels doesn't it so if the children can appreciate it as this fantastical um this mission this um um this quest isn't it to sort of find find his um, family um, but on the other hand, parents could be reading it with the children and see a lot in it that, that would be over the children's heads. Um, so yeah, it's one to read and reread at different ages, I suppose. Um, um, but yeah, we'd, we've um, talked about that a lot, haven't we, when we've been um, working on the Blasso book, um, Masha, about just do we shift the book to being aimed at a younger age group or do we keep it sort of... Um, aimed at 12 plus readers and, and what, how does that affect the choices that you make in the translation? It can be a difficult decision sort of translating for an imagined reader when firstly you don't have a publisher so you don't know which age group you're aiming at and even if you do does it, should it affect the way that you translate yourself? So, endless and Maybe we could read us. a little bit from, um, <laughs> we, we from now, the Heritage Cats and, and mm -hmm. get the audience to um, to tell us what they think in terms of age groups. So, um, I don't know, maybe we should describe this a little bit. What do yeah, you think? Yeah, why don't you say a bit about the book and about how, about how it came about that you you met Vlasov and we ended up working on it? Or how you fell in love with it? Yeah, so it's, it's called Priklucheni Ermitajnik Katov um, and it's been translated into several languages by now, including Mandarin, or it's according to Piotr. Uh, it, sell, it sells in a bundle of other books about foreign history. <laughs> and it sells really well, it sells like hotcakes. So about 50,000 copies, including eBooks, was sold um, and probably more by now. So it's very popular in Russia. People go to the shops, ask for it, and it's sold out. So um, 
it's a story is which is which travels across times it's quite a popular sort of you know um uh, trick that uh, authors authors use quite often to, to attract attention, and I, I think it's, it's quite well well done. It's, it's it happens in the modern days where uh, um, people have a characters have a chance to travel through time and meet Peter the Great and you know Pushkin all together, and then this magical character, magical body called Butadeus. Uh, but the main character is a cat, and he speaks. Once he crosses the one of the bridges in some piece book, he he can understand humans and humans can understand him. So it's a certain you know magical place where they all understand each other. This, this, they they become one. They they go through this looking glass where this where, where they where they can be equal. So yeah, and it's an adventure where um, you know, a bad character has to be defeated and. And then forgiven in the end. So um, um, Piotr has has approached me um, and asked if I would translate it. It's quite rare that an author writes to you asking to translate a book. Usually, it's done through a publisher. But he initiated this. He said he wanted his book translated into English. The author himself, without having a publisher, and uh, so he funded the translation himself from from his own pocket as it were which is which is unusual Ruth I think you said that you never had this kind of um, no, I've never done it never, uh, before and never since actually type um, of cooperation before yeah it's usually a publisher who comes to you and says yeah well, we want this book published and, and then you know that it will be published so we've translated it we loved it and so it's kind of became our job in a way to find a publisher we felt obliged <laughs> that we need to find one but we haven't yet so hopefully this this will happen another summer project isn't it start bothering people again about it <laughs> yeah so so it's um aimed at 12 year olds plus and there's there's quite a few issues there from a translation point of view why um and this is interesting um and why whether it should be translated or not it, it is this a lot of Russian history here, and and it's we were talking about this with Russo earlier today. Is this um, a good idea to introduce foreign culture um, as you know in this kind of cladding, as it were? Is this going to work? Uh, children, do they need to know about it? Do they want to know about it? Do they not? Do they want to know who Peter the Great is? My answer is yes, absolutely. Yes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. How do? How can you not know Peter the Great? But then you have to have a publisher's hat on, and the idea of you know sales and interest. So that's that's a big challenge, I suppose. Maybe that's why we haven't found one yet, Bruce. What do you think? Well, that in time. <laughs> Tatiana, what do you think? It's six o'clock. Should we do a reading, or should we open for questions? Um, let's ask the audience. Would they like to have a short <laughs> <Hands up. laughs> talking so much about it which is it's really interesting let's just have a very short extract and then we'll jump to questions yeah yeah so Marcia, do you want to read the, English, the russian first and then i'll read the english of this short extract and it's from the end of chapter six where we meet All right, so should we start with kaitis matri to sami court or do a bit shorter <laughs> yeah should we do the dialogue should we should we start yeah. with kaitis matri and then finish yeah. at Sorry. where the dialogue finishes yeah I should probably explain the setting. So um, the cat has been tasked, the cat who works at the hermitage and who is now the um, kind of the main messenger of Peter the Great, the wax figure of Peter the Great that comes live at night. So he is now a messenger and he was sent to find uh, a human ballerina to bring her to the ball at the hermitage that would happen at midnight. And so the cat goes and finds a, a ballerina, but he doesn't know how to, um, speak to her, how to um, lure her to cross the bank bridge so that she understands him and he can talk to her in, in human language. So he's got this job of, of, you know, making her listen to him and attract attention. Катя, смотри, тот самый кот, он за нами увязался, такой забавный. Может, возьмем домой еще кота к нашей муске? Сестра в ответ только фыркнула. Да, и устроим котоферму. Будем производить по 20 котят в год. А потом бегать, расклеивать объявления, отдам в добрые руки. Нет уж, спасибо. 
Да и не понравится Муське такой неинтеллигентный кот. Ей нужен потоньше и посимпатичнее. От обиды Васька чуть не развернулся на 180 градусов. Он оказывается не симпатичный, да еще и толстый. Да не нужна мне ваша диванная муська. У меня в округе верных поклонниц, хоть пруд пруди. Его остановил только задумчивый голос Маши. Такое чувство, что он хочет нам что-то сообщить. Глупо, да? Oh yeah, why not? Let's start a cat farm, said her sister sarcastically, rolling her eyes. With a bit of luck, we'll have another 20 cats next year, and then we'll be running around the streets putting up signs, lovely kittens to a good home. Thank you, but no. Plus, our Muska isn't going to be very impressed by such a dull, intelligent cat. And he's a bit chubby. She needs a sleeker and more elegant Tom. Basket was gobsmacked. He nearly turned around to go back. So he's not elegant and he's chubby. What impudence! As if he needed their Muska. No doubt some plump armchair cat. He already had plenty of feline admirers, dozens in fact. But just as he was about to leave, Masha said something that made him change his mind. I have a feeling he wants to tell us something. I know it sounds silly, but... There we go. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Short I, taste. It's a lovely, lovely book. I really hope that you will be able to publish publisher. So you're able to find the publisher soon, ladies. I wish you all the best. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, if the audience have any questions, I think now is the time to ask them. If not, um, we'll just wrap up and let's see if we have any questions. Masha and Ruth, could you also please check chat because for some strange yeah. reason it's not opening and I think it was blinking at some point. Yeah, I can't see any questions in the chat. Feel free to put on your um, video. Okay. Or maybe you maybe you could leave, leave, leave us yeah. some feedback in the chat saying whether you found it interesting if you don't have questions. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. And, uh, um, so, uh, well, yeah, I think I have a lot of questions actually, but just in the interest of time, I can I can um, go on for hours and hours asking about children's books and kind of talking about reading. Um, but uh, in the interest of time, I think we promise that we'll le let people go kind of now-ish. Uh, so just to wrap up, um, most of the titles that we talked about or you saw on the slides can be uh, ordered from the European school books. Um, we have a dedicated website specifically for the Russian titles. It's called, the, uh, it's called russianbookshop.co.uk. Um, also, I'll, I'll, I'll share all the links um, and the slides with everybody who registered and attended, attended after the event, so not to worry. Um, if you have any questions, do get in touch, let us know what you thought about the event, was it useful, whether you'd like for us to kind of come up with different formats or different topics moving forward. Um, and. Also, I'll share the links to Ruth and Masha's blogs as well, both the um, Russian literature blog and the World Literature Kid uh, blogs. Um, what else? Uh, I think it's been really lovely to have you, Ruth and Masha. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. There are Thank so you for many inviting. And uh, as I said, I, I, I just I, I think it's it's important to be able to know where to find them and kind of keep reading. We all have young children. We keep being we are kind of being told that young people don't read or, you know, there are always these kind of challenges, but maybe they just haven't found the right book, you know, because I'm sure there is always this book that stays with you. It's just kind of keep looking. And there are plenty of wonderful books and wonderful recommendations. So thank you very much um, for joining us um, tonight. And thank you to Ruth and Masha. And I think that's it. That's the end. Well, thank you for the lovely comments. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Tatiana, for having us. Uh, yeah, we could probably talk about it for hours, but it's better, <laughs> better to let everyone go. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
I don't know, uh, Tanya, if you want the chat saved, but I saved it. So you have all the names. Oh, the great. Oh, I'm just, yeah, yeah, I'm just looking at the comments because I, I, I know that you, I can save it. I just haven't found out because I, I was recording as well. So usually it records everything, including the chat. Um, but yeah. 